Hi, my name is Dr. Clayton Dick, and I am the uh, medical education lead for the Bezier Center for Global Family Medicine. And I'm also a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I'm here uh, to give you a, a small primer on how to put together a disaster map. Uh, this primer is intended for family physicians and primary care providers. And I hope that you find this fairly simple approach a good way uh, to be able to figure out what kind of hazards or disasters might be likely in your community and what sort of resources or priorities you might need to give as you do your disaster plan. I'd like to give my sincere thanks to Dr. Rosaria Inda uh, at Syakwala University in Banda Aceh, Indonesia, as she uh, provided the content for this particular presentation uh, and has given me the privilege of being able to present it to you today. Uh, it has been modified slightly uh, just to accommodate the presentation format, and I uh, think otherwise the content is essentially hers and uh, her colleagues at uh, SKU. So thank you very much again. Uh, for those of you who have accessed this video through FM Pivot, um, you can go to this section of FM Pivot uh, where there will be some more background uh, materials, uh, a handout uh, that contains a PDF of this particular presentation, the slides, and uh, a worksheet that you can use uh, to uh, try out developing your own hazard map and disaster map. Uh, if you are viewing this from another site, uh, just go to FM Pivot. Uh, and once you're in that particular site, uh, go to disaster planning module section number two, which is called disaster mapping, a simple tool for disaster risk assessment. So when you look at making a disaster map, there's really four fairly simple and straightforward uh, steps. Uh, the process can be done right at your desk and maybe take a couple of hours to do it. Uh, if you want to be more extensive with searches and consultation with the community uh, to produce it, it will likely take you a number of more hours to do. Uh, but the steps themselves are fairly simple and straightforward, and there are four of them, essentially. Uh, what For step one is to pr produce a hazard map. I'll explain a bit about what that is. So it looks at the various hazards that you have in your community and how the impacts might be of them. You secondly, produce a vulnerability map, which looks at the areas of, that are most vulnerable within your community and could be hit hard if a hazard uh, does come. Uh, the third step is conducting a capacity assessment to see whether your community or your context actually has the capacity to be able to do this. And finally, in step four, you conduct a scoring system looking at the previous three entities and uh, providing a final assessment and map uh, of the various hazards, looking at where the priorities may lie for your disaster planning. Oops. Uh, ultimately, uh, th uh, this presentation will lead to this table, uh, which uh, is considered the disaster map, which looks at uh, the ha <coughs> excuse me, the hazards you might encounter, their frequency, their impacts, vulnerabilities, capacity, and their scored uh, to provide a total score which looks at their priorities. Throughout this, we're going to use a case example which uh, we would like you to think about and apply, which is going to be near Banda Aceh, Indonesia. Uh, Banda Aceh is a relatively small city of 250,000 people uh, on the west coast of uh, Sumatra in West Sumatra province. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Banda Aceh as un a very unfortunately uh, the tsunami uh, disaster hit Banda Aceh in 2004. Uh, they uh, out because of this, uh, they have become experts at uh, disaster planning and relief and have lent their knowledge and expertise uh, globally uh, with regards to disaster planning. Uh, with this case example, we'd like you to think about being a family physician who serves one of the nearby villages to Banda Aceh. This is a common scenario, I think, for many of you where you might be serving a small town, a group of villages, and so on. But consider yourself that you've been mandated to help provide a disaster plan for your community. So the first step you're going to take is hazard mapping. 
Uh, for those uh, of you who have access to the FM Pivot module, uh, this infographic is embedded on the page that contains this video and goes through what kinds of hazards you might consider might affect your community. Uh, and I'll refer you to these, or you can look at these within your PDF. Uh, I would like to add that there is an additional hazard that isn't listed on this infographic, and that is of uh, biological hazards. And I think the classic that we are encountering right now is the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 uh, and uh, one thing to consider as well. Once you do that, um, think about what a hazard map is. And uh, essentially it's a method to explicitly identify what kind of hazards could happen in a geographical area or population, either globally, regionally, say one uh, part of a continent, uh, nationally, provincially, locally, or even at a household level. For your intents and purposes as family physicians or primary care providers, usually you're looking at the geographical region or community that you serve, such as your catchment area, uh, where your patient population is, uh, what the health region or district or sub-district or however you may define it may be. So as you go through this exercise, think about the area where you serve. The type of information you need are a list of the types of hazards that you may have either recently experienced and by recently, uh, we don't mean in the past year, we're really looking at in the past 50 years, uh, if they're severe, uh, and the types of hazards you might anticipate, and as well what their characteristics and causes might be, how likely, uh, how likely they might be to occur, and what their expected severity might be. Uh, certainly, you can do a lot of this from memory and your own experience just sitting at a desk. Uh, but also, if you want to do a bit of homework, uh, you certainly can use reliable online sources, uh, Google searches for government sites or library searches. If you have access to a, a medical library, it would be excellent for this. But as well, uh, if you would like to do a little more legwork, you can reach out to public health offices, hospitals, uh, fire departments or police departments, as they also are in a position where they have to do disaster planning. And as well, you can talk to various community stakeholders that uh, uh, might be in leadership uh, in your community. So um, as part of this exercise, you're going to see this uh, picture of Banda Aceh uh, popping up from time to time with the table on it. And uh, essentially the, what this means is that these tables uh, were information that were provided by uh, Siakwala University as they worked through their disaster mapping. And some of the, the uh, content and uh, all of the content that's provided is uh, what they perceived would be appropriate for their hazard map and the various tables. So this is their data, so to speak. So uh, for Village X, as we go through this uh, exercise, uh, the types of hazards that were identified were floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, and pandemics. Uh, as well, uh, as we'll see later, which isn't on the table, I note, but they do talk about it later, uh, is looking at ethnic conflicts as being a potential hazard uh, within their area. Uh, so what they've done is they've looked at the characteristics of each hazard, and I'm not going to go through these tables item by item for the sake of time, but they looked at characteristics of hazards, the causes of it, but most importantly, what, what they felt would be the severity of it and so uh, and the likelihood of occurrence. So let's say looking at flooding, uh, that uh, flooding seem to, seems to occur every eight to 10 years. Uh, and uh, with that, there are significant economic and transport impacts that if you chose to, you could define in more detail. Uh, earthquakes, interestingly, seem to happen once a month, uh, causing public panic, traffic impact and injuries. Now, the severity of these will vary uh, depending on the type of earthquake that they encounter. And of course, they looked at the tsunami, uh, which the severity was extremely high. Uh, uh, fortunately, the frequency is between t every 10 to 100 years. Once you've comprised your hazard map, what you can do is look at each of those hazards and see how vulnerable your community would be. So looking at what aspects of your community or your context are most vulnerable to a specific exposure from the hazards you've identified. How susceptible are, are they to the forces that are generated by those hazards? And what are the consequential losses or social costs that could happen because of this? Following this, uh, uh, looking at these questions, what you can do is list the specific areas of vulnerability 
uh, what you might define are important areas of vulnerability, and this will vary from a community and context. Apply a metric of some, time, of some kind to determine what would be considered a serious area of vulnerability, and then apply this metric to your own community context and score it in kind. And finally, if you're going to be presenting this, uh, you might want to list your data sources for some of this information. Uh, uh, when you look at categories of vulnerability, uh, there are five of them, social, cultural, financial, organizational, infrastructural, environmental, and human resources. And I'm going to walk you through each of these. Social and cultural vulnerabilities uh, have you considered, like, are there people in your community that if a hazard came along, uh, would they be at higher risk just based on uh, race, ethnicity, uh, regional conflicts, physical isolation, them having lack of shelter or lack of access to healthcare, or that they have a lack of knowledge or experience in terms of dealing with a, a disaster or a hazard. Uh, again, this is what my uh, colleagues in uh, Banda Acha provided. Uh, they, uh, just looking at uh, characteristic number one, uh, they defined that there was a vulnerability that were, was racial and ethnic, uh, primarily defining it in terms of ethnic conflicts. And uh, they used a yardstick to say that if ethnic contexts were quite frequent, it would be a considerably vulnerable area, it would be considered a red or dangerous uh, vulnerability. If they didn't happen that often, they'd still be considered to be yellow, that you should be aware that this is going on, but less of, a, less of an issue. Uh, they, uh, when they went through this process, they interviewed the heads of the village uh, to get their sense of how these conflicts were and uh, so on and so forth. I'll go through these tables uh, only briefly, uh, just uh, for the sake of time. And uh, the next vulnerability uh, identified is financial vulnerability. Is your population financially secure and does it have access to funding if needed in the event of a disaster? Uh, uh, benchmarks you can consider uh, would be employment rates, home ownership, access to financial institutions. So can they actually access money either in their bank accounts or through loans? And do they have the ability to access and afford uh, nutritious food? And again, uh, looking at these vulnerabilities, item number one, I'll just go through, they identified uh, employment as a vulnerability. So if uh, uh, 50% of uh, the community were jobless and uh, there wasn't uh, uh, a lot of variance in terms of the type of work that people do. Let's say everybody just worked in one particular factory, so only one skill set, it would be a dangerous vulnerability. Uh, but if they were uh, fewer than 50% uh, people uh, uh, did not, I'm sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, 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 greater than 50% of people had jobs, but there wasn't a lot of variance, that would be a yellow zone. Organizational vulnerabilities. Uh, consider uh, whether the governments and other community organizations would be able to function in the event of a disaster or hazard. Uh, benchmarks might consider might be trust in existing institutions by the community. Uh, do these organizations have existing local wisdom uh, that, that they've had from previous hazards or disasters? And actually, are they, uh, do they have the capacity to provide and maintain uh, support to the community? And again, uh, looking at this, uh, number one, uh, looking at uh, the government's ability to maintain social cohesiveness is a very vulnerable area if it can't. Uh, and the metric is is just an indication of what the, the trust is to the government. Uh, if it's low uh, because of corruption or whatever other reasons, uh, it would be a danger zone. If there's moderate trust, it would be a yellow zone. And the data source could be interviews with key stakeholders in the community. Uh, the data source column I've, uh, it has been left out by our Banda Ache uh, colleagues, uh, but uh, you certainly you can get a sense of how they may have gone about to get this information. Uh, item number four, vulnerabilities are infrastructural and environmental vulnerabilities. So are there other uh, factors which might affect the population in the event of a hazard, uh, such as lack of clean water already? Or is there a lot of pollution? Uh, are there areas of soil degradation which would, could be affected by flooding or massive winds? Uh, and as well, more at an infrastructural level, like are there emergency response warnings or shelters available? Um, and uh, looking at number one, uh, early warning systems, either you have them uh, or you don't, but uh, uh, red would be no emergency warning systems. 
Yellow would be that there are flood sirens, but some of them are broken uh, and they need maintenance. And finally, human uh, vulnerabilities and human resource vulnerabilities. So are there segments of the population that are going to place a greater strain on the healthcare system in the event of a disaster? Uh, older uh, individuals or younger individuals, uh, those who have existing special needs or pre-existing disease, uh, those individuals who have a lack of awareness on how they can access healthcare. And uh, certainly in uh, my city of uh, Vancouver, uh, resistance to care, which was uh, demonstrated uh, during the pandemic where a number of individuals were resistant to getting vaccinated. Um, and uh, are there sufficiently trained individuals to meet these needs? Now, some of these will overlap with looking at capacity and uh, we'll discuss this in the next section. So uh, looking at item one here, age composition, uh, their metric was looking at the number of people who uh, were of reproductive age. Uh, uh, they've written productive age. Uh, but the number of population and reproductive age is greater, uh, is uh, less than those uh, of a non-productive age. Uh, I think that what they meant to say here uh, is the number of people in the population who are of reproductive age and generally healthier versus the, those who were not. Uh, so just turn those lesses and, uh, and more signs around uh, as an indicator. So once you've gone through uh, the uh, uh, vulnerability assessment and vulnerability map, you move on to your next step, which is a capacity assessment. And simply it's looking at how well your community might be to deal with the various hazards and vulnerabilities you've identified. Uh, and uh, in, uh, ways of looking at this are looking at social and cultural engagement, economic support, uh, existence of policies uh, that are, are part of disaster planning and disaster relief, uh, the existence of infrastructure and the existence of human resources. Uh, and uh, when you look at benchmarks for this, you apply a very similar process as you did with your vulnerability assessment, uh, green, yellow, and red zones. Uh, you can apply whatever benchmarks you think would be appropriate for your community. Uh, for uh, Banda Aceh uh, and uh, SKU, uh, they uh, looked at the existence of community organizations that were dedicated to looking at disaster mitigation. They were looking at areas of food security as part of capacity, the presence of emergency policies and various infrastructures and so on and so on, and then uh, assigned a level to them. So once you've done steps one through three, you're ready to conduct your final assessment. Uh, as we noted, uh, uh, through steps one through three, uh, you're essentially going to be considering how you might score them. And I'm going to show you the rubric for this in the next slide. Uh, your total score is going to indicate where your priorities may want to be in terms of hazards or disasters. Which ones require the most attention? Which ones may be a priority for steps to decrease any identified risks? And the great thing about this is you can come forward with a disaster map, which you can actually present to community leadership or key stakeholders to give them a sense of where your priorities may lie and where the vulnerabilities and need for increased capacity may lie. So this scoring rubric is as, as follows. Um, it's a score from one to five in column two. Uh, you're essentially going from very high to low, uh, but looking at the frequency that these disasters may occur, uh, looking at all five areas of vulnerability and coming up with a composite idea of how vulnerable the population might be to those disasters, and looking at uh, fin potential financial losses and casualties. In column three, you're effectively looking at capacity. Uh, and the, the score then will go from uh, uh, five to one, from low to very high. So again, doing a composite of how much capacity your community has. Adding it up, a score of zero to eight would be a low priority uh, that uh, uh, we'll show uh, an example of that in a sec. And nine to 16 is a moderate priority and 17 to 25 would be of high priority. So this is effectively uh, what ends up becoming your disaster map uh, in uh, a nutshell. Uh, we talk about these, uh, the various rows indicate those uh, domains that we talked just re reviewed in the previous uh, slide. Uh, and uh, for uh, the Banda Aceh village, uh, 
uh, the hazards that were identified. Again, were ethnic conflicts, earthquakes, flooding, and flooding, I, I, I interpret to say, uh, is due to tsunamis as well, and epidemics. Uh, the interesting part is that when you look at the scoring, um, uh, the area that got the highest priority was, uh, not surprisingly, was uh, flooding and tsunamis. Um, uh, uh, the frequency, albeit it was uh, a low frequency, the impacts were very high. Uh, the communities are still perceived to be very vulnerable and capacity scores were uh, 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 relatively uh, high. Uh, so despite the fact that there was capacity, uh, all the other areas indicated there was a high risk of, uh, uh, from this particular disaster and a score of 20. Uh, it's interesting to compare this, though, to, uh, to earthquakes, which, uh, while uh, it uh, scored as they happen quite frequently, their impacts were less, uh, uh, the vulnerability was slightly less, uh, but uh, uh, the capacity uh, was considered to be very high, that they had a system in place and the, the community was ready for these things. And so their score was less, it was 14. So when you look at the colors here, uh, flooding and tsunamis was uh, rated as high risk. Uh, uh, earthquakes were considered to be of medium risk or medium priority. And the other two areas, while still important, uh, epidemics and ethnic conflict were considered to be of lower priority. And this just reflects this in this uh, particular slide. So, so those are the steps in making a disaster map. Uh, again, to review, you conduct a hazard map, uh, conduct a vulnerability map, do a capacity has assessment, uh, uh, conduct scores in for each of those areas and conduct your final assessment to produce your map. I hope that you found this particular presentation useful. I uh, invite you to participate in the discussion board uh, for uh, FM Pivot uh, if you'd like to discuss this further. Uh, or reach out to the uh, developers of FM Pivot if you have further questions. Uh, thank you all for uh, sitting in uh, for the past 20 minutes or so and wish you well as you prepare for your next uh, disaster. Uh, the next section of this uh, module will look now at disaster planning. How uh, do you actually develop a plan uh, to prepare for the hazards that you've identified? Again, I'd like to pass on my thanks to Dr. Rosaria Inda and the faculty at Siakuala University for providing the content for this particular talk. Thank you again.